Welcome to Discovering. Our country is deep in history. Join me as we travel a couple of centuries back in time for a glimpse at our past. We have a rendezvous. It's a time period situation where you have uh, represent the 1700s and the 1800s and the different things that they did back then. People helping people is catchy here in the UP. We'll take a look at what Wildlife Unlimited of Iron County is doing to help disabled hunters get in the woods. All that and more, so sit back, put your feet up, it's Monday night and time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Our country is certainly rich in history. We see it in books and learn about it in school. But what if we could get a first-hand look? Something that would give us a real sense of what it was like living two or three hundred years ago. I traveled to North Dickinson School where I found exactly that. I can't remember for how many years we've been doing this uh, over at North Dickinson, but we have a rendezvous. It's a time period um, situation where you have this, uh, represent the 1700s and the 1800s and the different things that they did back then. What we do is we invite different schools from the county, also from Iron County to come fourth graders. They ship their kids in the buses and then they go to specific stations every 15, 20 minutes, they rotate. We have a shooting station here uh, with some of the time period guns with black powder. Um, well, this is more like a shooting, teaching kids how to shoot a gun and stuff and uh, muzzle loader. We put the powder in and then we put the paper towel and for wadding and we just shoot and have fun all day. And uh, I'm kind of giving like Civil War information. Uh, Generals, Irish Brigade, I talk about. That's one of my favorite parts of the Civil War. Um, but just teach kids about history around this area. Jackson standing like a stone wall. His army, was, or his troops were standing actually like a stone wall. That's how he's got his name. Uh, I believe his, his real name was Jackson. Um, I forgot his last name though. But his Stonewall Jackson is his nickname, and he was really cool. He's one of my favorites. Um, we have a hatchet throwing station. This is the tomahawk throw. Uh, this is the tomahawk shaft, or this is where you put your hands. This is the tomahawk head. They're not very sharp, it's sharp enough to stick in the log. And uh, if you're right handed, all you have to do is stand uh, both feet together, put your hand on the bottom of the shaft. And when you throw, you got to keep your hand out in front of you. And you just got to bend your arm and step with your left foot. Sorry, my bad. Left foot. And you want to make sure that you release it right in front of your face. Because if you release it too early, it's going to go flying forward. And if you release it too late, it's going to go straight to the ground. So when you get that straight arm and you step with your left foot, it gets that perfect rotation of the forward, which you want. So when you throw it, you release it right in front of your hand. And that gives it that perfect rotation and it sticks. But if you're lefty, you hold it with your left hand and you just, same, same deal with the hand motion, but you step with your right foot instead of the left. We have a cast iron cooking station where they make cornbread. Today we're um, just helping the kids out. We're showing them how to make cornmeal over a Dutch oven. Uh, explain a little bit how you go from the corn to the meal like the uh, settlers did uh, back in the 1800s, 1700s. But we're also talking about how to make butter something to put on the cornbread and then when we, after you're done cooking the cornbread, we let the school kids uh, sample the, what, what we've cooked.
kids at North Dickinson get a lot out of this. I'll tell you, with my eighth graders, job skills. You know, how to, how to work as a group. There are 40 or 50 people putting this together. They're, they're asked to do something. They don't question it. They just do it. Uh, smile on their face. People skills that oftentimes not necessarily taught in school, just curriculum and objectives. So it's a kind of a job uh, situation for them. And I teach eighth grade history, so my eighth graders have learned all about this, these different time periods. It's like a culminating activity. I live up here by North Dickinson, up by Norway Lake. I've been up here for quite some years. I've been trapping for quite some years. You know what a muskrat yeah. looks like? Yeah. A mink? Yeah. How about a beaver? You gotta know what a beaver looks yeah. like. Everybody knows yeah. a beaver. You know, trapping's starting to become a thing of the past. And I'm, I'm trying to hope and pray that I get enough, a couple of kids' attention where, hey, I want to try this. I want to go out and I want to do this. They don't need to go out right away with a great big trap. I've showed them with small traps. I even showed them with a mouse trap. You just got to start somewhere. And then from that point, work your way on up. Somebody's always out there to help you. If not, they can call me or somebody that does trap. You, you want to help them because that, that's the generation. Them are the next people that are going to keep this going. And uh, I'd be the first to say, the way it looks right now, I don't know. I really think it's a dying sport. I'm the bell ringer. I ring the bell so people know when like, to switch stations. <laughs> she's basically the town crier. And she's really loud in the hallways. That's why we, she's just a loud student, but fun, has a lot of enthusiasm. So the town crier back in the old days went around and you know, yelled the news. So she's ringing the bell. Every so many minutes for rotation, she does a smashing, smash-up job. The uh, students are usually interested in how fire is made without a match. And so what I do is uh, demonstrate to them two different methods of fire. The uh, one used in Northern Europe in prehistoric times, which is uh, striking fire with uh, flint and uh, some sort of an iron-containing compound like steel. And in uh, southern, uh, in the Mediterranean, the Egyptians, like King Tut, uh, were using, uh, rubbing two sticks together, the bow drills in particular. Uh, the children usually are quite fascinated with the procedure and the, the fact that uh, without a match you can actually make, or a lighter, you can actually make a fire. This is a fire board. This is a fire drill. This is a fire bow. And here's a little socket to cover the top to hold it all steady. Now the, the American Indians did not use the bow. They did it this way, it's called a, a hand drill, because you use your hands to turn it. The Egyptians used the bow, and that's what I'm going to show you how to do. The reason is I've been trying for 15 years to do it with a hand drill, and I haven't managed to do it yet. But if I move this back and forth, it will turn this bow, or this drill. and. With a little bit of luck, the rubbing of the two sticks together will make charcoal, like you see lining these holes. The charcoal will grind off and collect in the bottom here. And if it gets hot enough, it'll make a spark. It's not enough to make a spark. That's not, you can't cook anything on a spark. You have to catch the spark, then you have to make it grow, and then have it burst into flame. Uh, I've been doing it since I was a child, uh, learning in the Boy Scouts and uh, enjoyed showing the kids the magic of making a fire from scratch. Well, we're just doing zipper pulls and they pick out their own beads and um, put them together on a head pin and then the other girls help them make them into little uh, so that they can put them on their jackets or backpacks. We have a sewing station. After the, sh the wool is washed and cleaned it needs to be, all the fibers need to go in the same direction and so you have to card it and these are very old carters. They were my grandmother's and she used to do the spinning of the wall and carding. So all the fi it makes all the fibers go in the same direction and it gets all, any uh, um, lumps and bumps out of it that were left over after washing. And so then after all the fibers are going in the same direction, it's made into a roving, 
roving ball. So all these fibers are going together in the same direction. Then it's ready to be spun. This is my Sleeping Beauty spinning wheel from the 1800s. It's a one treadle spinning wheel. I work it with my foot and I make a spinning triangle and the fibers go together. It gets spun onto the spool. This will be a one ply yarn. When I have my two spindles filled up, then I weave them together and they are a two ply yarn, which ends up looking like this. There's my two ply yarn. Well, the kids have a lot of questions about changing the color and I bring in the plant dyes that we use. I've got some wool here that I dyed with blueberry juice, so it's a natural dye. And then I've also, I also talk about just the writ dyes that you can buy and how wool will repel the water and keeps you warm and how the fibers are woven together. The reason I was interested in, wool, in spinning is because of my grandmother. My mother always told me stories of how she would spin. It's just so much fun to have the sheep, get the wool straight from the sheep and be able to make some, something to wear. <laughs>
I make two sizes of quivers. One is a three inch and that was more traditional. And then the other one is about four inches in diameter. I also make pack baskets. I make a 22 inch high one, which is made specifically for ice fishing. And they take it out there and it fits the, the tip ups will go in there without even showing. And then I make shorter ones for just general use. And actually I make smaller ones. I'm gonna be starting a, a line of pack baskets for women. A woman came by and was all excited about it. And after she left, she bought it. I thought, well, you know what? We deserve some too. <laughs> so that's coming up. I'm here for music, uh, talking a little bit about how music was an important part of the development of here in the UP. Um, we talk about the history of who came here and why they came here and, and what kind of music they played and, and what they played it on. Froggy went to court and then he did ride, sword and pistol by his side, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, can you come in on those uh-huhs? Well, this okay. is a two-day event and it takes a lot of different people to cooperate and get the job done. North Dickinson Schools, I'm a teacher, they give me uh, two days to work out here with my eighth graders. They have two days, they dress up in time period clothes. You have the exhibitors are donating their time or sacrificing their time to, to hang out with the kids and show them how things were back in the old days. A bunch of other students that are here too helping and along with that a great organizer in Lisa Town that kind of puts everything together. So we have a lot of people involved and the kids at North Dickinson helping out, this, this would not work out. They're just a bunch of awesome kids to work with and really have some unbelievable people skills. He rode up to Miss Mousy's door, uh -huh. He rode up to Miss Mousy's door, a place he's been many times before. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a look at what's going on across the UP this week. On June 5th, Richard P. Smith will be featuring a program about understanding Michigan black bear at 7 o'clock central at the Ottawa National Forest Visitor Center in Waters Meet. This weekend is free fishing weekend here in the state of Michigan. All fishing license fees will be waived for two days. Residents and out-of-state visitors may enjoy fishing on both inland and Great Lakes waters for all species of fish. All fishing regulations still apply. On Saturday, the Forest Service sponsors the 23rd Annual Kids Fishing Day at Camp 7 Lake Campground in the Hiawatha National Forest. Registration is from 11 to 1 and activities will be going on until around 3.30. The event is free for kids 16 and under. For more information, visit fs.usda.gov slash Hiawatha and click on News. The M&M Great Lakes Sport Fishermen will be holding their annual Kids Fishing Tournament on Saturday the 7th. For more information, contact Brian Claremont at 715-735-7346. Also on Saturday the 7th, the Fumi Lake Commission invites you to the Little Fumi Flower Walk at the Fumi Lake Natural Area near Norway. The event begins at 8 o'clock central and Phyllis Carlson will lead the walk. Turkey hunting is a popular and ever-growing sport here in the UP. It's enjoyed by hunters of all ages and capabilities. But for some, it's just not as simple as heading out into the woods in the morning. Thanks to the generosity and dedication of numerous organizations and individuals across the Upper Peninsula, the joys of hunting are accessible to all including our physically challenged. We're showing uh, everybody the Wildlife Unlimited trailer that we built here a couple of years ago from uh, Iron County. Uh, we want to promote it so people are, are familiar with what it, it is and that it's available to everybody to use. Uh, this morning we've had Rob Ivey from Iron River hunting with us again. Rob's been quite successful. He's shot two turkeys out of this trailer in the last couple of years, a couple of bears and a couple of deer. This, uh, this whole trailer came to be from uh, a challenge that Dave Painter uh, had given our organization. Uh, Escanaba, Ken Buckles has three of these trailers over there and so they were working with us and help us to design what we needed to facilitate this side of the UP. And uh, the, the trailer is a $16,000 unit and most all of it was, was given by donations. There's a lot of people in Iron County that wanted to see this succeed and, uh, and they have and, it, and it's here now for people to use. So we're encouraging that uh, if people have disabilities and difficulty walking and they want to get in the woods, uh, there's a lot of us volunteers that are here to help with that, that whole thing. And there's a variety of different places to hunt as well, uh, as well as different species to hunt. We go bear hunting all the time. 
the bear hunting story from this year was the bear came in and had a white V on it. And Dave and his son's fiance were more excited than I was about shooting the bear. It comes in, I didn't even give it time to eat, eat any of the bait I shot. It runs like 15 yards. And it, Dave and Chrissy were freaking out. Oh. Or she was freaking out more than I was. Last year it was a 30 minute turkey. In and out in 30 minutes. This is the system we use. This is from Be Adaptive uh, equipment uh, that, that allows people with uh, disabilities to get out hunting. This is a camera that mounts on the back of the scope and then we get the image on the screen. And then we have a trigger assembly which is actually a trunk release for a car and this is what actually fires the gun. We set that up right in front of the trigger. And then when our hunter, they sip on this tube and that's what fires the gun. And without it, there's, there's people that uh, they just wouldn't be able to get in the woods anymore. Some people talk about it being you know, just a computer game, but it's not just a computer game. Uh, without this, people like Robbie couldn't get out and hunt. So, um, and we're still, as you can see, it's still hunting. Today we couldn't call in a bird. Uh, it, it's, it's just not a computer game at all. We, there's still, you know, you're still firing a real gun. You still have all the elements to deal with. Uh, and sometimes the birds just don't cooperate. But yeah, it's a pretty cool system and uh, very high tech and we're very fortunate to have it here. We just need to get more people, get the word out that it's here, it's available. Um, yes, it's in Iron County, but if it's needed somewhere else, there's a good possibility it could be used uh, anywhere in the UP or Northern Wisconsin. We just like to see it get used. Hunting is always fun. It's been a passion of mine for ever. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.